So our next presentation is by Millie Chapman of the University of California, Berkeley, talking to the role of AI in post-2020 biodiversity targets and effective management, something very close to the work we're doing here at FAO. Hi, my name is Millie Chapman and I'm a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley in the Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management. Today I'll be presenting about the use of AI in conservation decision making. I'll highlight some of our recent work showing that reinforcement learning holds promise to improve our capacity to effectively make decisions in the wake of global environmental changes. I'll also present some of our work on the ethical issues and power considerations that are critical to equitable and effective application of algorithms to conservation decision making. While human impacts on ecosystems rapidly accelerate, our techniques for observing those impacts are increasingly outpacing our capacity to respond to them. Advances in artificial intelligence have largely been applied in conservation science to more precisely document the impacts of environmental change through improved and automated data classification workflows. But solutions to the global biodiversity crisis will rely on more than our capacity to more precisely estimate animal populations or dynamics. We must also improve our capacity to translate imperfect information about environmental systems into effective management decisions. So throughout this presentation, I'm really gonna focus on the work that our group is doing to explore applications of algorithms in decision-making and decision support processes. But can AI really help us make better conservation decisions? That question is inherently both technical and social, and the two parts of this issue are interdependent. The few projects I'm going to briefly present on today are addressing this larger question and the result of collaborations between environmental scientists, computer scientists, sociologists, and ethicists. Um, I'm going to start today with some of the technical work happening in our group, um, which is largely exploring deep reinforcement learning as a method for addressing environmental issues. So quickly before I get started, um, I just wanna explain what reinforcement learning is. It's really just an area of machine learning concerned with how intelligent agents ought to interact with an environment in order to maximize some notion of cumulative rewards. In the interest of time, I'll spare you all the details here, but if you're interested in learning more, I'd encourage you to look at our lab's recent preprint um, on these ideas. But in the most basic terms, reinforcement learning consists of an environment, which might be a fish stock or a wildfire or any number of environmental problems. And then there's an agent. So the agent takes an action in the environment. So in the case of fisheries, um, the agent might choose a harvest quota. And then the agent receives an observation of the environmental response to its action and a reward. So over thousands or millions of iterations, the agent learns how to effectively interact with the environment to maximize its rewards. So some of the advantages of using reinforcement learning over traditional optimization or decision theoretic approaches include flexibility in problem formulation. The environment can be really indefinitely complex and have large state spaces. Now the agent might have trouble in a particularly complex environment, um, but there's no true constraints on the way um, in the same way that there is um, with traditional approaches to control problems. Um, additionally, uh, reinforcement learning can leverage existing ecological models and simulations for agents to interact, interact with. So in this preprint, we show that reinforcement learning holds promise for informing decisions um, for a number of environmental crises um, using primarily uh, simple examples. So kind of what next? Um, we're continuing to work to develop more complex case studies. For example, can reinforcement learning help us design dynamic marine reserves in a changing climate? Um, second, we're continuing to work to develop methods and theory around this approach. So what conservation questions are most suitable for reinforcement learning um, and 
what reinforcement learning algorithms are most effective at solving different conservation problems. But I wanna go back to the second main part of effectively leveraging AI and decision-making processes, which is that these are not just technical questions about algorithm design, um, but they're also social and ethical questions. For whom are these algorithms really creating better decisions? In a recent published paper, we explored these broad questions in the context of algorithmic um, recommendations to high seas conservation. Among other points, we show that because algorithmic approaches at a global scale largely consider the costs and benefits of conservation action to only a subset of human actors, their applications can stand to reinforce power asymmetries due, to, due partially to um, data disparities. For example, um, high seas fishing and seabed mining is largely done by industrial countries. Um, so if we're trying to maximize biodiversity protection on the high seas while minimizing the impact on um, some sort of economic profit, uh, we are largely considering uh, large industries and largely ignoring coastal communities. Moreover, um, algorithms used in decision-making processes have the potential to shift power dynamics along multiple axes. Maybe most obviously, algorithms can shift who pays the cost for conservation and who receives the benefits. Um, but algorithmic approaches um, to conservation decision-making can also shift who decides what questions we ask and how we frame those questions. So is there an equitable path forward? Um, and can we harness these technologies in a way that benefit more than just the powerful few that are designing and implementing them? This question continues to be an active part of our research, but in our in a recent paper um, where we were looking specifically at high seas conservation, we argue that algorithms can be a part of an equitable decision-making process if equity interventions are taken throughout each stage of the prioritization process from procedural justice in the funding and team assembly um, for a project to the integration of social science data and methods in the algorithm. Um, to distributional equity assessments of algorithmic solutions to ensure that optimal solutions are also equitable solutions. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge and give a huge thanks to the team who led a lot of the work I presented today and to the many other collaborators who made this work possible. Um, I'd also like to thank our funders uh, for their support and thank you for listening and please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions. Thank you very much, Millie. Thanks for sharing your story. Um, in FAO, we do have a vision for more productive and more sustainable fisheries and agriculture, especially from the fisheries and agriculture division section of the agriculture outlook. But I think more and more people are recognizing that the word equity or equitable needs to be part of those types of visions because we've seen too many problems where we're trying to deliver outcomes. And I, my question to you is, when you've run these more theoretical overviews, where do you, where do you see the, the biggest opportunities? Is it, maybe, maybe I will just, when you started, did you have any surprises on, on what you found when you started to really do the research on it? Or did anything come up again and again, which just showed you that that's so important? Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a, a really interesting question. And I think it's specifically an interesting question when we start to think about the use of these algorithms on the global scale. Um, a lot of the data we have at a global scale, particularly on human dimensions, is incredibly biased. Um, it's biased towards large industry, largely because that's um, where we have sensing technologies on vessels or um, whatever else it is. Um, and it's largely not. Um, in human dimensions of coastal communities um, or other communities that might be underrepresented also at a negotiation table on a global scale. Um, and so I think it's really interesting to, to start to think a little bit more about how we start to mitigate um, some of those data disparities that exist in 
human dimensions data. Um, and I think that there are also data disparities in ecological or environmental data, um, without a doubt. Uh, we have more data in parts of the world than other parts of the world. Um, but I, I think it's, I've found kind of through some of the research we've been doing over the last couple of years that that's um, particularly uh, striking um, when we're thinking about human dimensions. Thank you, Millie. Um, Matt, can I turn to you? Yeah, fantastic presentation, Millie. Really interesting to, and very important to explore this. Um, can you tell me in more detail about how um, ecological simulations can be integrated with reinforcement learning methods and other resources for making this possible? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And, and thanks again for having me here today. This is a really cool forum. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so there um, are a lot of cool resources in terms of like uh, applying reinforcement learning to different environments, which I kind of presented in that one slide about uh, some of the technical work that our lab is doing. Um, and the preprint that I referenced has some great resources of how you develop um, environments to test different reinforcement learning algorithms on. Um, and yeah, there's a, a whole um, kind of project being run largely by computer scientists for um, testing different reinforcement algorithms. It's called AI Gym, and you can develop or environments of your own. And so we've been developing environments that um, kind of mirror environmental problems that are hard to solve with traditional optimization approaches. Um, and yeah, kind of seeing which reinforcement learning algorithms are effective in those um, different environments. But uh, yeah, I, I guess I would point people towards that preprint um, and or uh, kind of AI gym and some of the resources that exist there. And do you integrate any um, sort of behavioral change psychology into your, your work as well? Yeah, I think that's a, a really interesting question. Um, so a lot of this reinforcement learning work um, is more like, uh, how do we best like control a system or how do we like best make decisions about a system and less kind of about understanding the dynamics of a social environmental system that might be um, experiencing both policy changes and behavioral changes. Um, but I think that's a really interesting point that you raised that a lot of these methods are also interesting for um, starting to understand the dynamics of, of human decision-making um, in a complex environmental system. So if you have an agent interacting uh, dynamically with a system, you could imagine um, kind of tweaking that agent and kind of exploring how behavioral changes might influence the trajectory of an environmental system. 